from her imprisonment for drug trafficking to the media attention and public debate her case generated. Join us today as we ask, was Chappelle Corby innocent? Before we begin, be sure to subscribe to They Will Kill You. Hit the like button and request any topics you'd like to learn about in the comments section below. Number 9. Who is Chappelle Corby? In October 2004, Chappelle Corby was arrested at an airport in Bali when 9.3 pounds of cannabis was found in her bag. Her subsequent conviction of 20 years in prison was confirmed and finalized by the Indonesian Supreme Court in March 2008. Corby's case would generate a number of theories and unanswered questions, including whether she had previous knowledge of the drugs in her possession or who the drugs were meant for. The reports and evidence which came to light at various moments alternatively incriminated Corby or offered arguments towards her innocence. She was released in 2014 after serving nine years of her sentence and after completing her parole, deported back to Australia. Number 8. Corby's Early Life Chappelle Corby was born in the Australian state of Queensland in a suburb called Tugan. Her parents divorced when she was a baby. Aside from her brother and sister, she had three step-siblings from her mother's subsequent marriages. Corby dropped out of high school when she was a sophomore and enrolled in a part-time beauty course. She got married to a Japanese man, Kim Tanaka, in 1998 and lived in Omazaki for a few years. The marriage, however, didn't last and their divorce was finalized in 2003. Upon returning to Australia, Corby had a stopover in Bali. She had been to Bali several times before, since she was 16, and it had also been a stopover on her way to or from Japan. Number 7. Arrest In October 2004, Corby flew to Bali to visit her sister, Mercedes. She flew from Brisbane to Bali, transiting in Sydney and was accompanied by two friends and her stepbrother. When customs officers from the Ngururai International Airport in Denpasar checked her unlocked bodyboard bag, they found 9.3 pounds of cannabis in a double plastic vacuum sealed bag. She claimed that she'd never seen the drugs before. There have been conflicting testimonies on how the interaction between Corby and the customs officials took place. Corby said she opened the bag herself, while four customs officials claimed in court that she tried to stop one of them from opening the compartment in which the drugs were found. According to them, she said, I have some. This provided a prosecution with what they needed to proceed with the case. Corby's traveling companions said they'd seen her pack the bag herself and that it contained only her flippers and bodyboard. Number 6. Trial The prosecution argued that the bag was Corby's and that she was fully aware of its contents, while the defense claimed the drugs were planted. An argument was made that Corby was an unwitted courier in an interstate drug operation between Brisbane and Sydney. The defense argued that the baggage handlers were involved. This theory was supported by John Patrick Ford, an inmate from a maximum security prison in Australia. He was taken to Indonesia and testified for Corby. He claimed that he'd overheard a prison conversation in which the drugs ended up in her bag by mistake. He alleged that someone was supposed to remove the drug bag in Sydney, but this never happened so Corby unknowingly carried them to Indonesia. He added that they belonged to a man called Ron Weigenser, who later denied the claim. Ford was facing rape charges at the time and his testimony was dismissed as hearsay. After his conviction, Ford was beaten and stabbed in prison, which according to his girlfriend, happened because of the evidence he'd given in the Corby case. Corby's defense asked for the footage from the airport CCTV cameras to be examined in court, but according to Corby's mother, it was never presented. At Brisbane Airport, the bags belonging to Corby and her companions hadn't been weighed individually. Corby had asked Bali police and customs to record the weight of her bags. The argument was that the difference in weight would have proven the cannabis was added after she'd checked her bags. However, her request was denied. The defense also asked for forensic testing, stating that if fingerprints found inside the bag didn't belong to Corby, it would offer an argument towards her innocence. Despite their request, fingerprinting was never carried out, and the prosecution deemed it unnecessary since the bag was found in Corby's possession. A sample of the drugs was never provided either, even though the Australian government asked for the chance to test them and discover their origin. 
it would have strengthened Corby's case if it was discovered that the drugs were from Indonesia. Number 5. Sentence In April 2005, Corby made a final plea for acquittal saying, I cannot admit a crime I did not commit. And to the judges, my life at the moment is in your hands, but I would prefer if my life was in your hearts. She then declared her innocence in Indonesian. In May, the verdict was broadcast live in Australia and New Zealand. Corby broke into tears as she was found guilty and sentenced to 20 years in prison. She subsequently appealed the decision and Bali's High Court reduced her sentence to 15 years. However, towards the end of 2005, it was reported in the media that Australian authorities seized photos of Corby and a man involved in marijuana smuggling after having searched the alleged dealer's home. The photos were said to have been taken prior to Corby's arrest. However, according to Corby, her mother and Michael McCauley, the man in the photos, they were taken when she was already in prison in Bali. However, prosecutors were confident that after seeing her in photos with a drug dealer, the judges handling her appeal would increase her sentence. In January 2006, her sentence was increased to 20 years by the Indonesian Supreme Court, a decision which became final in March of 2008. Afterwards, the evidence gathered in the case was destroyed. Number 4. Life in Prison Corby shared a cell block with 85 other women. She asked permission to run a beauty school in prison, but although reportedly considered, nothing became of it. She spent most of her time making jewelry and assisting other women with personal grooming. While in prison, Corby was taken to the hospital and treated for depression on several occasions. In 2008, she was allowed to leave the prison under armed guard to visit a beauty salon. When word got out that she was there, Corby was stormed by reporters and attempted to hide her face. Her doctors claimed that the impact of this event basically annulled her treatment. She received medication both for depression and bouts of psychosis. The deterioration of her mental condition in prison was also confirmed by an Australian doctor. He had been flown to Bali and argued for Corby to be transferred to a hospital in Australia. The Premier of Queensland also supported the idea of Corby serving the remainder of her sentence in Australia. There were talks between the Australian and Indonesian governments of a potential prisoner swap, which could have included Corby, but it never happened. On the grounds of her mental condition, a clemency appeal for humanitarian reasons was made in 2010. The Indonesian president agreed to cut five years off her sentence in May 2012. Number 3. Parole As part of various national celebrations, Corby was given two years, three months remission on her original sentence. She was released on parole February 10, 2014, after serving nine years in Karabokan prison. As part of her parole, she had to live in Bali and follow a set of rules until her final release in May 2017. These conditions involved reporting to the Corrections Board at least once a month, avoiding the use and distribution of drugs, and oddly enough, dressing neatly and appropriately for the officials. Her sister, Mercedes, was married to a local man and she was staying in Bali, so Corby lived with her. Upon Corby's release, the media circus that ensued made her life difficult. Reporters followed her constantly, but another condition of her parole was her not giving interviews while still in Bali. When her parole was completed, she was deported to Australia in May 2017. Number 2. Theories There have been a number of claims and theories regarding Chappelle Corby's case. Some seem to exonerate her, while others depict her as a skilled manipulator. In 2011, one woman stated that she dated a Brisbane airport baggage handler whose colleague planted a large bag of cannabis in a traveler's bag in October 2004. One investigative journalist released a book called Sins of the Father, alleging that the drugs actually belonged to Chappelle's father, Michael Corby. The journalist alleged that Michael McCauley, the man who'd visited Chappelle in prison, was working for her father and running a drug syndicate. Chappelle had thus become a pawn in her father's operation. Convicted drug trafficker Renee Lawrence also made some incendiary statements. Lawrence was the same age as Corby and imprisoned for being part of the Bali Nine, a group of Australians caught attempting to smuggle 18 pounds of heroin 
out of Indonesia. Lawrence claimed that Corby confessed to her that she was aware of the drugs in her bag and that she pulled off the same maneuver several times prior to being caught. She also said Corby told her that she'd been faking her mental illness symptoms in the hopes of getting leniency or a reduced sentence. Jody Power, a woman who'd lived with Mercedes Corby in Bali during her sister's trial, also made several allegations. During a paid interview for an Australian program called Today Tonight, she claimed that Mercedes had previously asked her to smuggle drugs into Bali. She added that Mercedes herself had confessed to smuggling compressed cannabis into Indonesia and that the drugs had been concealed inside her body. Mercedes Corby would eventually sue the producers of the show for defamation and the case was settled outside court. Number 1. Media and Public Response Chappelle Corby's case received a lot of media attention, particularly in Australia and New Zealand, but also in Japan and the United States. After her arrest, a campaign entitled Free Chappelle started to gain traction in Australia and 100,000 people signed a petition for her release. There were even demonstrations outside the Indonesian embassy in Australia. However, at the Australian embassy in Jakarta, there were several protesters who in 2005 were calling for her to be given the death penalty. In 2006, Corby released a book entitled My Story, which sold over 100,000 copies. The media would closely follow and eagerly report on any development regarding her trial as she became a celebrity in Australia. Ultimately, public opinion became more split, even though initially it leaned in favor of her innocence. As of the making of this video, Chappelle Corby is still living in Australia. In January 2018, she released a pop song called Palm Trees on Instagram, along with singer Nat Zelani. It featured a homemade video with photos of Corby taken after her return to Queensland. Thanks for watching. What else do you know about Chappelle Corby's case? Tell us in the comments section below.